All right, everybody, wanted to do a quick overview of sparkling wine today. So uh, we're going to do a 100-level course, just the real basics, and take you through Sparkling Wine 101. So quick in generals about sparkling wine, it can be made from any grape, anything. doesn't really matter. Uh, one of the interesting things about sparkling wine is it's a great opportunity to use a lot of different varieties that are already existing in order to uh, make a wine that is palatable to a broad variety of people. And what makes this really exciting is that you can use some hybrid varieties that are cold tolerant. You can use things that are overproduced uh, just for fun. So you can make sparkling wine if you have too much Cabernet. Uh, Merlot, um, you've made sparkling wine to Cabernet Franc. They even do that in the Wa, the Wa anyway. So there's really no uh, basic rule. You can't use any, any grape at all. And the primary reason why the variety itself doesn't matter a whole lot is you're picking the grapes so early to make a very you know, neutral base wine, that there isn't a lot of flavor development yet in the grapes because we're picking them at somewhere between 16 and 20 bricks on the high end. So that means that the fruit haven't developed yet. And so basically we're just trying to get acid water with a little bit of sugar in it. Um, so that's what's really kind of nice about sparkling wine and it's really an opening up a lot of frontiers. And the other thing that's great about sparkling is that because it isn't a varietal designate, it's not something that people expect, you can go ahead and uh, they, they just want it sparkling. They care if it's red, white, or rosé, and they care about its sweetness, but it doesn't really matter the grape variety because there's not a lot of varietal designate uh, uh, sparkling wines. You may see some varietal designate like Blanc de Noir. That means it's white from black. Um, so a white from a black grape means that it's from Pinot Noir. So most of Champagne, which most people don't know, is two-thirds black grapes. It's um, primarily Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier as a whole, and then Chardonnay is about a third of it. They're all about a third, a third, and a third for making sparkling wine. So most uh, Champagne is made from black grapes. So not an unusual thing to use uh, black grapes to make white wine. Um, it's a couple of different styles. Primarily uh, tank method or traditional method, and then there's transfer method, method ancestral, and then of course there's forced carbonation. As a matter of fact, there's a, a huge booming business going right now um, up at Ancient Lakes uh, in Washington where they're just forced carbonating wine. They've got a really special piece of equipment, and they can get some really nice results uh, just by literally forced carbonating like a soda bottle of wine, basically the equivalent of a soda stream for wine. Um, however, uh, most sparkling wine is really uh, made by trapping um, you know, yeast, uh, CO2 from the yeast. So fermentation process, basically, if you're explaining it to a kindergartner, basically what yeast do is they eat sugar, they pee alcohol and fart carbon dioxide. So if you want to think of it in a little bit of a nasty way, when you're uh, drinking a uh, bottle of sparkling wine, you're actually uh, sniffing the uh, yeast farts that come off. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, the traditional method because this is the one that's gonna be most common. So let's talk about how we go through the process of making sparkling wine. So the first step is to make the cuvee. And the cuvee is a really simple word that basically means tub full or vat full. It's a fancy word, everything sounds better in French. So uh, basically it's just making a base wine. And the base wine is a simple high acid uh, white wine, and that's going to come in around you know nine to eleven gram, uh, percent alcohol, um, and a titratable city somewhere between six and ten, maybe even twelve uh, grams per liter. Pretty high acid, and because of that, the pH is really low. These wines are really easy to make uh, because the yeast aren't having to ferment to high alcohol levels. And uh, additionally, you've got high acid, the pHs are really low. So the chance of something going wrong is, is pretty uh, limited. So we make this sort of nice, neutral base white wine. And the key is, and we're talking about traditional method, notice I put up top, it's fermented in this bottle. And this is an important distinction. That means that when you're drinking a traditional method bottle of wine, it was a base wine that was then put into the bottle with some sort of sugar, and that secondary fermentation was uh, then allowed to happen in bottle. And we call that a tirage or entourage. Uh, that means that it's on uh, the side, uh, it's in the bottle, re-fermenting. Re Wines can be entourage for a very long period of time, depending on how much development you want. So with tirage, what we're doing is taking that base wine, we're gonna have base wine that's completely dry, then we're gonna add a very specific amount of sugar to that wine, and then we're gonna add yeast again. And now this is a really complicated process. You've gotta do it very timely and very intelligently because if you make mistakes, bad things can happen. So um, the thing is with sugar, you need uh, about 12 to 18 grams a liter to end up with the carbonation that you'd expect in like cider because the amount of sugar that you have is going to directly translate 
into the amount of carbon dioxide you get. And we can calculate this pretty accurately. So uh, if we get 12 to 18 grams a liter, we're going to end up, you know, somewhere around, you know, four atmospheres of pressure. So that's, you know, around, you know, 80 to 90 PSI, which is, is or actually about 60 PSI, which is no joke. Uh, if you ever have a tire pop at 60 PSI, that's pretty impressive. Um, but that's enough to get you the kind of bubble uh, or mousse uh, or foam. Uh, again, things sound better in French because uh, you don't want to say, oh, look at the foam on that one. Uh, you want to say, you know, mousse. Um, so uh, that would get a cider, but realize this is a really small number because there's a thousand milliliters in a liter. So 12 grams of sugar is, you know, only 1.2% uh, sugar or, or 18 would be 18, uh, you'd be 1.8% sugar. So it's a very small amount, not something you can measure on a hydrometer. You have to have really accurate measurements uh, of, your, of your wine before you go to bottle. Because if you go just a little bit higher, we're gonna be in this 20 to 24 gram a liter range. And this is uh, enough to get you champagne or Prosecco. And this is gonna put you closer to that, you know, 80 to 90 PSI in the bottle. Now realize that 90 PSI in glass is, is pretty surprising. So if you mess up and you go just, you know, to 25 or 26 grams a liter, um, you essentially will make a bomb. And so uh, you, very commonly people make mistakes where they're missing by their sugar by just a, a couple of grams a liter and then they end up uh, blowing the bottles up. And I do know uh, two people, I know one that's missing an eye and I know another guy that's missing uh, most of his fingers uh, to due to exploding bottles because they miscalculated. So uh, this is uh, something that requires a lot of precision. This is not easy to do. Um, so then after we have that re-fermentation in bottles, so entourage, it takes a while for that second fermentation to happen because this is a really horrible environment yeast to be in. We've got uh, alcohol, the alcohol is climbing, and then we're putting pressure on them. Their pressure starting to, to squeeze the yeast as they kind of finish up. And they don't have a lot of sugar to work with anyway. So they're just kind of trudging through it. And it's a really kind of awful situation to put yeast in. And then they kind of eventually peter out and, and die off. But that process of re-fermentation takes you know, anywhere from, you know, 60, uh, you know, 30 to maybe even 90 days. It's a really long, slow, drawn out process. And then after that, we age the wine. Now, how long do we age? Well, uh, how long is a piece of string? W what's the goal? What do you want? Well, all the flavors you have in sparkling wine really come from the aging process. They don't come from the fruit. Um, they come from the, uh, what we call autolytic character, and that's the taste of the yeast dying. So that kind of yeasty, doughy, toasty component that you get in uh, sparkling wine that comes from the aging and now how long can you age sparkling wine well entourage pretty much forever uh they're more or less immortal the longer you leave them entourage uh they're gonna be uh you're gonna get more of that yeast autolysis characteristic so the uh, best thing is to come to those who wait uh, the longer you can wait the better but you can age for you know nine months to five years you can age even a decade um i still have uh, quite a bit of sparkling wine that's been on Lees uh, since 2011. So we've got, you know, you know, 10, 11 years on, on Lees and that wine's, you know, really quite delicious and autolytic. But one of the things to know is that this is what we call Sir Lee and it's on the side. So that's the Lees are on the side of the bottle. And then what we do after we age, there's going to come a point in time, we're going to want to bottle that wine. So we're going to riddle and disgorge. And, and when we riddle, that means we take the bottles, we turn them upside down and go from Sir Lee on the side to Sir Point which means the yeast are now down in the point of the bottle. We want to get them down in that neck of the bottle because that's what we're going to want to get that yeast plug out. There's going to be a yeast plug that eventually develops in that bottle. Um, so we get the yeast all to settle down in the neck of the bottle. Then traditionally you freeze the neck of the bottle. There are some people that are fast enough that take the bottle and right as the bubble rides up the, the, uh, to the tip, you pop the top and the yeast plug will shoot out. Um, I tend to degorge uh, by hand when I'm doing my hand degorging I do it underwater but uh, for the most part um, and you just use your thumb you degorge real quick underwater stand the bottle up you know, blow the yeast out stand the bottle up burp the pressure off and then go to your dosage but um, you know there are uh, the vast majority of uh, sparkling wines that are done traditional metal method in this bottle the bottle that you're drinking it out of um, are the necks are frozen and then uh, mechanically degorge um, and then after you get that yeast out of the bottle, um, you got to top it up and you're going to want to add what we call a dosage. So that dosage is the next step where we add a certain amount of sugar, maybe a little bit of sulfur dioxide. Sometimes they call a expedition liqueur or a shipping liqueur. Um, back in the day, in order to get wines to ship and last longer, we added alcohol, we fortified them. So it wasn't unusual for 
um, uh, for sparkling wines to have some alcohol added to them. That's not so much the case anymore, but uh, you know some people still do it. But primarily, it's just a sugar addition, um, and that sugar addition is just to make the wine palatable because you have a couple of things happen. You already have a high acid grape anyway, and then you have the perception of acidity because the bubbles on your palate have a perception of, uh, we call it carbonic acid. And you'll ever notice that if you have a, a flat soda pop, you notice how sickly sweet it tastes. It doesn't taste so sweet when it's got bubbles in it, but as soon as the bubbles are gone, you're like, oh man, this is really sweet. Well, that's because that you've got to balance that acidity out. And so one of the things we do in all winemaking is this idea of sugar acid balance. And so we're going to want to add an amount of sugar to make that wine uh, more palatable. So there's a, a bunch of different levels and we'll, we'll talk about them uh, in a little bit more detailed chart. And then once you finally add your dosage, you top up the bottle, you put a cork in, you put a cage on it, voila, you finally have sparkling wine. And this is a long process because the cuvee takes months to make. The tirage is going to take years to, to, you know, be on tirage and age. And then, you know, then you got to riddle the gorge and, and, and sell it out. So sparkling wine requires a whole different set of equipment. It requires um, uh, a whole different production process from standard winemaking. Although the front end is very similar to make the, the base wine, after that you're into a whole uh, set of specialty equipment to get to get that to happen. So a traditional method that you are aware of are ex including, but not exclusively, because they certainly do tank method and champagne too. Uh, champagne, uh, Cremant, Frankie, Frenchie Accorda, and Cava, and of course we have a lot of delicious sparkling wine made in in Washington. Uh, you know, uh, Domaine St. Michel has been going for a long time as a way to get rid of uh, too much Riesling. Um, and then California, of course, places like Schramsberg uh, have been making fabulous sparkling wine for a long time. Uh, Tasmania makes some of the best sparkling wine in the world if you ever get an opportunity. Most of it is all consumed in Australia. Uh, and then Deutscher Sekt, which is um, uh, the type of sparkling wine they make in Germany. So uh, all over um, as well. So this is the other kind of sparkling wine, and I, I'll probably do a little less detail on this one. But uh, this is what we call the transfer method, and this is known as fermented in the bottle. Um, so one of the things about sparkling wine is that the, the, when you're fermenting in the bottle, if you want to get a little more pressure in that bottle, glass always hasn't been as good as it is today. And so the really heavy-duty sparkling bottles that would handle the type of pressure that's in the tirage, because when you degorge, you lose quite a bit of pressure. So they ferment up to that close to 100 PSI in a really nice, heavy bottle. And then what they would do is they'd age the wine, and then they would uh, spear the top of that heavy bottle and empty it out into a tank where they keep it under pressure in the tank. And then they filter it under pressure, and then they add an even uh, dosage and bottle in order to get a consistent product. But the bottle that they ferment in is like about a $2 bottle, which is pretty expensive. And then the bottle that you bottle in is a $1 bottle. So then you just use the heavy expensive bottles for only that high pressure fermentation piece. And then you can use a less expensive bottle uh, for the dosage and aging. This is really common in Australia, primarily because glass was a lot harder to get, much more expensive. Uh, so they found a way of, of using you know, the expensive bottles for just the fermentation process and then bottling into a less expensive bottle. So again, that idea that these are more common in Australia and also really common for non-standard bottles for doing the really big bottles and then also doing the 375s because in 187s, because could you imagine uh, having to uh, degorge little 187 mil bottles of sparkling? So a lot of times they do that in order to, to change the size of the bottle. And most 1.5 liter bottles are not fermented in the bottle. They are not strong enough. So anything that's a 1.5 and up was most likely fermented in a 750 and then packaged up to size, because if not, you have bombs. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, probably the most common kind of sparkling wine that's made is uh, fermented in the tank. So same process, you make a base wine, except then you ferment it in a tank that can handle a lot of pressure. So then you, you ferment and trap that, you know, the yeast CO2 in a big tank where you hold all that pressure into a big tank. These tanks are very expensive. They're called Charmat method tank um, and uh, they're fermented in a tank and then they're filtered all under pressure. All this has to happen under pressure. They're dosaged and bottled under pressure. The key thing with all of this is, is everything you're doing is, is really high pressure. This is really scary stuff because you're working with a tank that's under 100 PSI, that's you know a big thick wall tank, they're very expensive. And then your filtration has to be able to handle that 100 PSI as well. And then you go through and do the dosage. 
and, and you do that all in tank after you filtered it and then you bottle. Um, it's much less expensive because the handwork is much smaller. It's just like bottling, you know, uh, regular wine. And you can even take the, the step of the middle of this out and just make a base wine that you force carbonate like a soda stream uh, and bottle. And that's a very inexpensive way to do wine. I think the probably most common one you see in Washington be like the pop up by Charles Smith. Uh, you know, nine bucks. They're slinging it out all day long and uh, a very, very affordable way to make uh, bubbles that are accessible to all price points. So the most common tank method wines that you know of are like Prosecco and Lambrusco, a Moscata di Asti and Aspi Spumanti and Sect and all other moderate quality sparkling wines like the Cook Champagne that you have, which shouldn't be called Champagne. That's why they can't change the label because it's grandfathered in. Um, all those really affordable kind of uh, intro level sparkling wines, those are all, all done in tank. And that's how you get those economies of scale down low enough. Uh, and these wines are quick turn. You know, a lot of times you can take it from crush to secondary fermentation to bottle within you know three months. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the fastest I've ever done uh, something like a tank method with a little bit of force carb was uh, we did uh, 22 days crush to glass. So from the second you crush it to the second you bottle it, you can do it in under a month. So if you look from a cash flow perspective, a far better uh, solution than uh, trying to do traditional method, which takes you years and years and years to do. All right, so uh, this is also another way of doing it. This is called uh, Method Ancestral. And this is a way that um, we kind of played with this year where you do your first fermentation and then you get it cold, hold it, and then you bottle it with the natural sugar. Also kind of like pet nat, really similar process. We're using the, the sugar that is uh, right there. So you do your first fermentation, halt the fermentation, hold on to the, the bottles, and then uh, go ahead and, and finish the fermentation and bottle. Uh, the one that we did this year, Method Ancestral, we did it four feathers. And uh, what we did with that wine is we uh, machine harvested some Malbec at about 20 bricks. Uh, then we uh, pressed it right immediately into rosé. We fermented it and then at uh, 27 grams a liter of sugar, uh, we spun it down with a centrifuge. And then we added our yeast and adjuvant, which is a, an adjuvant, is a, also known as an alignate, is a betonite algae mix. I know it sounds crazy, but it uh, changes the polarity of the, the yeast um, uh, cell and it doesn't like to stick to anything and so it's like Teflon for yeast basically and it allows things to riddle really really easily and then we went ahead and waited till the sugar came down to 24 grams a liter and bottled it and so that's a way of using the natural grape sugar instead of having to add uh, sugar as well to the to the mix and then uh, and it'll be our joke that we we don't have to add sucrose to the wine which is just a, a fun way to play things and just use the natural grape sugars that are already there uh, but that's a method as a straw and then most of the wines from the uh, Method Ancestral, very few, like Loire and the Jura. And uh, there's a big, uh, you know, research of the natural wine movement. Uh, there's some local stuff at, you know, Foundry and Grow Grain that does stuff. And then Yellowhawk, which is uh, who I'm working with this year, uh, did some Method Ancestral. All right. Last thing I want to point out, and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap this up, uh, is uh, what does the uh, dosage mean? Is how much sugar are you adding to the wine at the end? So Brut Nature means that there's none, it's natural, it's a dry wine. Very, very few producers go all the way dry. Sparkling wines are tend to be actually quite a bit sweeter than most people know um, because that perception of acid and bubbles really covers it up. So, uh, but it, it is a weird scale. So we have Brut Nature, then we have Extra Brut, uh, which is an interesting term um, it, because it's drier than Brut. Um, so, um, and then, uh, which means a brute is probably the most common designation. Um, and, uh, that's about six to 12 grams a liter. Then you have things like extra dry or extra sweet, uh, which is just super complicated. And whoever labeled these things should be smacked. It must be a French person, uh, because they had to make it super complicated, uh, and not make sense to anybody, uh, that would have logic or reason attached to them. So, uh, extra dry is 12 to 17 grams a liter, but most of the wines fall somewhere between uh, brute and extra dry. Uh, then we have, uh, dry wines, which are also sec, which means sweet, um, which is <laughs> 17 to 32 grams a liter. And then demi sec, which is semi sweet, uh, is 32 to 50 grams a liter. And then there are dew wines. Now realize that's uh, quite sweet. Uh, 32 grams a liter is 3% residual sugar. And then sweet wines do is five to 10% sugar. So those are quite sweet. Those would be really heavy, heavy dosages. Um, but uh, most, like I said, most of them fall between that extra brute and extra dry uh, category. And I think most sparkling wines kind of fall in a brute. 
Another couple of terms is uh, most sparkling wines are non-vintage. Uh, they blend across vintages. Uh, it's a way of using up bad wines. Some wines could have five to seven different vintages in them. Um, and uh, but generally it's a couple of years and that allows them to hit consistency year in and year out. Then you have vintage, uh, which is a single vintage requires about three years on lease. Usually most houses do four to 10 years. This is a year that is the best, like the fruit came in the best. Everything is the best. And they, the, the, the people come in that uh, kind of in champagne, they all get together and say, this is year we declare a vintage. And there are some years they don't declare vintage when the fruit isn't good enough. Um, and again, that idea of Blanc de Blanc, white from white is 100% Chardonnay. Blanc de Noir is a black, you know, as a, a white from black. And then rosés can be a whole bunch of other things, but there's really no, uh, no right answer. Uh, and then there's like the prestige cuvee, which would be the top uh, bottling of a house, like Dom Perignon from Moet and Chandon. Chandon obviously makes a huge amount of sparkling wine, but Dom is is considered the best. And Dom Perignon, just to make you know get rid of any mythology, did not invent sparkling wine. Sparkling wine was invented um, probably about 500 years before uh, Dom Perignon set foot on Earth. Um, he was, however, credited with creating the uh, cage that holds the cork on, which allowed the, the the pressures to get a little bit higher. So we give we give Dom that one, um, but he's uh, certainly not the first person to come up with it. Uh, and then uh, also, like again, talking about the high end, like is uh, Cristal from Rotor, which does a huge range of, of sparkling wines, but the Cristals they're they're high end. And that's all, folks. So let's do a quick review. Cuvée is making a base wine. Tirage is the process of adding some sugar and re-fermenting. Surly is the aging of a bottle while it's on its side. Then we take it to Sir Point by riddling, whether we do that in a riddling cage or on a riddling rack, or we just put it in a box upside down for uh, you know, a month or two and kick it occasionally. All those things will get the yeast down into the, the neck of the bottle. Um, and then we degorge, um, and that's the process of projecting that you know yeast out of the bottle so we get nice good clarity in the wine nobody wants cloudy wine and then we uh, finish up the process by doing a dosage and that dosage is the amount of sugar that we add at the end usually from a, a just a sucrose solution but dosage can be a whole bunch of things usually it's just sugar but sometimes we add a little sulfur dioxide to bind up any aldehydic characteristics in the wine or maybe we'll add a little liqueur but there's a lot of things that you can do at the end to to modify the flavor of the wine so uh, most of the flavor in sparkling wine is from secondary characteristics. It doesn't come from the fruit, which is what makes sparkling so unbelievably versatile uh, from all types of viticultural regions uh, and using up all different kinds of grapes. So it makes it a real fun uh, process. And, and the, the cool thing about sparkling wine is the rules aren't really written. There weren't like uh, a whole host of people putting, you know, commissions together and bureaucracies and everything that declared, you know, sparkling wine a, a certain way. So it's it's really a, a true uh, pioneering uh, place to be. And it allows us a lot of flexibility and creativity because, you know, the rules haven't been uh, completely defined yet. So anyway, uh, have a glass of sparkling. Cheers.